Hey, thank you, uh, Rick. As mentioned, my name is Ed Mast. I am the FreeBSD Foundation's Director of Project Development, and I have George Neville Neal with me as well. He's on the Board of Directors of the, the FreeBSD Foundation. And I want to talk about the ways that FreeBSD Foundation supports the FreeBSD project, but a lot of it is sort of general, generally applicable to uh, a found open source foundation supporting a, um, a BSD project. And so this is the mission statement of the, the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, and mission statements, you know, are often kind of assumed to be um, sort of pithy statements that don't have um, uh, a lot of structure behind them. But it actually has a, it does have a lot of meaning. Um, and one of the, the points is that the FreeBSD Foundation's goal is really to support and assist the FreeBSD project um, in, in a lot of ways. And the worldwide comment is important because the FreeBSD project is a global, uh, a global project. There are committers all around the world. It's used in, in many different places. Um, and so, although a lot of infrastructure may be hosted in the United States or things like that, um, the project itself really is a, a global organization. So this is a, a quick description of the FreeBSD Foundation. It's a 501c3 registered in the United States, which means it's a tax-deductible tax charity. Um, and that both uh, enables and constrains some of the things that the, the foundation can, can work on. Um, but at the, the end of the day, it basically means that the foundation is supporting the FreeBSD project in ways that are, have a, a public good for, um, for FreeBSD and, and for, for others. The board of directors is listed here. It's an all-volunteer board. Very early on, it was a very active and hands-on board. Um, the board of directors we're also people who did a lot of work in the project. Um, I think as time goes on, one of our goals is to bring on uh, members to the board of directors to have complementary areas of, of expertise to try and help the foundation expand in ways that are outside of the domain of, of sort of soft, the excellent software developers that have been involved in the past. Um, and I've got two people uh, bolded here, George and Drew. Um, who are directors uh, of the foundation that are, are with us uh, at BBSD Con here. And as well, we have quite a few staff members, um, which is somewhat of a more recent uh, development in the foundation's history. The foundation has been around since 2000 um, and has had an executive director, Deb Goodkin, at the top there for much of that time. Um, she was in involved, uh, she was brought on fairly early on. But then the rest of the staff listed here are, are all within the last two, three, four sort of years that, uh, that have been, um, that the staff have been hired. And this has really allowed the, the foundation to expand in uh, the scope of, of things that it, the foundation works on. And that really comes with both a development in the foundation's history and also just in um, increased budget through, um, through donations that's allowed us to bring on, uh, on staff. And the final point on this slide is, is really important um, because the FreeBSD project is an open source project that um, has, um, has developers all over the, um, working on FreeBSD for their own, their own reasons um, and their own desires and goals. It's important that the foundation is transparent in the sorts of work that it does, where, where the funding comes from and, and the projects that it spends on, uh, its, its resources on. So all of the foundation's financial statements are available on the website and you can, you can see how much money is raised and exactly what it's being spent on, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more over the course of this talk. But um, it, all of the, the detail to a very, uh, very, very specific level of detail is, is available. So if I just present this as sort of a, uh, an org chart of, of FreeBSD, um, we have the, the core team that is the leadership of FreeBSD and this this core team is, it's a member, uh, it uh, consists of nine members um, elected by the FreeBSD developers every two years. Uh, originally, in the, from the very beginnings of FreeBSD, the core team ended up basically, uh, it, it wasn't an elected core team, it was the initial set of, of very small uh, FreeBSD, set of FreeBSD developers in the beginning. I mean, the, the core team was basically the team doing the FreeBSD development, and then over time, uh, additional people were brought onto it, but there wasn't really any kind of process or history or um, 
uh, sort of tradition for how people joined or left the core team. Um, and so I, I think in, in the early uh, uh, 2000s, there was some sort of disagreement perhaps um, within the FreeBSD project and the way some things were happening with the core team. And through all of that, uh, that transition, FreeBSD ended up with a elected core team um, chosen by the, the members of the project. And then the core team has responsibility for uh, all the various sub areas within FreeBSD. So the release engineering team and the security team and the cluster administration team that manages all of FreeBSD projects resources and, and so on. I mean, I, I have it extending off to the right. There's quite a lot of teams uh, within FreeBSD and the core team has uh, administrative oversight for all of them. And so at the same time, um, as, as th those sorts of things were happening, the FreeBSD Foundation was also founded uh, at, at the same sort of time at, uh, in 2000. And of course, there was a lot of turmoil and change happening. And so the, the question is, where would the, the foundation fit in to the, the FreeBSD project? And so one possibility is the foundation could sort of, um, a foundation could exist that controls the project and the core team is sort of uh, um, reporting to the, the foundation. Um, and this is sort of the way I think that the NetBSD Foundation works in that the NetBSD Foundation is actually the NetBSD project. Um, and then there's differences with the way that uh, the NetBSD Foundation's directors and members um, are, are handled with respect to, to the NetBSD developer community. Um, but in FreeBSD, the decision was made that the foundation would be separate and sort of adjunct to the the FreeBSD project. So the foundation and the project are obviously very closely related, um, but are actually two completely distinct entities. Um, and then, of course, as uh, budget and development in the foundation's history allowed, um, the foundation was able to bring on staff and issue uh, grants to, to developers for taking on specific projects. Now, I present this, this graph as kind of a nice, clean separation um, of, of areas that the foundation and the project work on. But really, there's kind of a couple of little dotted line um, relationships within here. So the current uh, release engineering lead on, in FreeBSD and the FreeBSD project is a, um, a foundation employee. Um, and there's some overlap between the foundation board of directors and the core team. Um, and this is sort of uh, perhaps understandable given that the sorts of attributes that led to people being very involved in FreeBSD and being chosen to, to come onto the board of directors of the foundation are also the same sorts of attributes that would lead to them being good candidates for the elected core team. But I think over time, that will sort of um, become less true in that as new members are brought onto the foundation board to, to try and take the foundation in, um, in areas beyond just the, the low level technical focus, um, th there will be less of a, uh, an overlap between them. And that's really, it, this overlap is really incidental as opposed to intentional. There's no, um, no desire codified in the foundation's, uh, the, the way the foundation is, is set up to have this, this overlap. So really this is the way that the, um, the diagram uh, looks for the perspective, from the perspective of understanding the roles of the project and the foundation. And so what does that really mean? The foundation's goal is really to support the project in areas where the project um, maybe has gaps or otherwise isn't able to, to be as effective as, as it could. Um, so it's not to take over anything in the project, it's not to run the project, it really is to support the project. So what are the sorts of things that the foundation does to support the project? Conferences is, is a, a very big, uh, very big one. Um, Getting people together in the same place to talk about uh, and present the work that they're, they're working on, what's interesting to them, and figuring out what sorts of um, areas of common interest there may be and projects can be worked on together is, is really important. And so uh, the foundation provides direct uh, financial sponsorship to a number of, the, of conferences. There's the, the sort of um, long-running big three uh, BSD conferences, BSD CAN, EuroBSD Con and Asia BSD Con that have been going on for quite a while, as well as um, helping other conferences that come along. And so, I mean, we're we're very very happy to see um, the, the second VBSD Con instance here, and it, it's really nice to have this sort of event on the east coast uh, of the U.S., um, which has sort of been underserved uh, recently. 
Um, and then other, other conferences as well, some Bay Area uh, vendor summits. Uh, Meet BSD ran in the Bay Area last year. It's not on here because this is the 2015 list. Um, and then also helping to fund conferences that are not the traditional big BSD conferences, but otherwise have some interest or relevance to the FreeBSD community. So this is where um, things like uh, Women in Courage and Grace Hopper come in, where uh, uh, there's a point I'll get to in, in a moment, but really helping to support the broader FreeBSD community beyond just the software development focus that, that's sort of very prevalent at the big uh, traditional BSD conferences. And then travel grants. So if we have a lot of conferences, we also need to help people get to these conferences. And so the foundation supports individual developers with grants to cover um, travel and accommodations, airfare or, uh, or train or, or what have you, to get to the conferences where, um, to provide the most value to the, the project. So we'll, over, um, over 2015, we've had more than 15 developers apply for and get travel grants to a number of conferences. I think about, uh, about five different conferences um, in there. Uh, and w one of the really important things is that I think a lot of people aren't aware that the foundation will provide travel grant support to developers for non-BSD conferences, not sort of non-conferences uh, other than BSD CAN, VBSD CON, et cetera. Conferences, obviously, that have relevance to FreeBSD or to, to the BSD community but aren't the traditional BSD-focused ones. And so this is things like XDC 2015, the um, uh, X.org Developers Conference. Um, so it's important to get FreeBSD people to these other open source conferences so that other people in the broader open source community realize that FreeBSD is still relevant and that the BSDs are still around and have an interest in this, this sort of thing. Um, and so that the BSD community can learn from what's happening um, outside, uh, outside of the um, sometimes insular BSD world. Um, so there's a lot of things happening beyond our borders, and it's, it's really important to have people going to these other places and, and learning about that. Um, the foundation provides legal support. So anytime there's a, a legal situation involving the FreeBSD project, the foundation has resources to bring on legal staff and answer legal questions. Um, if the core team needs to draft a policy, um, the foundation can provide access to the, the lawyer to, um, to ensure that the, the, the policies are, are uh, within the constraints of, of what's, what's legally permitted. The foundation owns the FreeBSD trademark um, because the foundation is a legal entity that actually exists. The project is sort of a, uh, a collection of individuals that isn't a single legal entity. Um, and then the foundation also can cooperate and interact with uh, corporations that may have information of relevance to individual FreeBSD developers and in cases where those those organizations aren't set up to deal with a whole bunch of individuals who are going to be coming and going at different times. So the foundation can say, execute an, a non-disclosure agreement with an organiza organization, get access to some documentation, and then in turn execute individual agreements with, develop with the developer community to make documentation available um, on an as-needed basis. And that can survive the um, sort of the transitions in, in who's working on a project or, or that sort of thing. Of course, the constraint is still the, um, the overall agreement that the foundation um, is a party to. Um, so you know, it, it's not like the foundation can sign an NDA and then just give um, documentation away, but it, it, it provides a, a much easier avenue to make that documentation flow to the developer community. Foundation provides a lot of support as far as physical infrastructure hardware goes. Um, so over the last two years, it's been about $200,000 worth of, of server equipment. And this is sort of everything from production, um, production servers that are serving the freebsd.org uh, website, the source code repository, the Bugzilla instance, and all of that sort of um, you know, production-facing uh, hardware, as well as test, uh, test servers. So we have a the, uh, FreeBSD project has a network test cluster uh, hosted at Centex Communications uh, a little internet service provider that is maybe 15 minutes uh, away from where I live uh, in Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, and the foundation has provided a, a number of big servers to the, um, to the, to the test cluster that's, that's hosted there in order to be able to test scalability on high core counts or 10 and 40 gig networking. Uh, foundation also has provided uh, can, can make available specialized hardware to individual developers. So if someone needs to work on a, a driver for some piece of hardware or something, the foundation may be able to, to provide um, 
access to one of those devices to, to individual developers. And then foundations also started providing a lot more non-X86 hardware to the developer community. Um, so there's a, a Power8 um, Power Eight system installed in a West Coast data center that's being used for, for bringing up FreeBSD on that architecture um, and uh, a number of sort of 64-bit ARM platforms of various, uh, various sorts are getting sorts are getting distributed around. Um, and then you know, BeagleBone Black 32-bit ARM platforms as well. Another really important function that the foundation can fulfill is advocacy. So it's important that people know about FreeBSD, that people f learn about FreeBSD. So if they are, um, you know, if they're, they're looking for an open source operating system, FreeBSD is top of mind and they'll, they'll give it a, um, some consideration and try it out. And so there's, there's a number of different ways to do that. George will talk about the FreeBSD Journal a little bit later, our, our new online uh, magazine. Um, we want to try and bring in new people into the FreeBSD community that have not been typically well represented within the, the developer community. Um, and then other ways that are, are mentioned on, uh, on here. Basically producing um, material that we can go out to and, and present at conferences or distribute that shows why FreeBSD is valuable. Um, and be able to actually do print runs and things like that, that the project itself may not be able to. Education is, is related to, um, is strongly related to, to the advocacy um, component, and this is something that the foundation has put a lot of effort into sort of recently. There's a middle school program that Justin Gibbs, the foundation president, and Deb Goodkin, the executive director, have been working on, um, and this is, they're, they're delivering it to a middle school in Colorado. I think it started yesterday, it was the first one, and um, it's, it's uh, um, going to be sort of a uh, semester-long class using FreeBSD um, as a, a teaching platform. Um, so I'm, I'm very eager to, to hear how that's, uh, that's starting to go. Um, there's also a university course that Robert Watson, uh, another um, another foundation director and, and George have, have worked on. So Robert Watson's teaching that course at the University of Cambridge as a master's level, uh, uh, master's level operating system course. And it's, it's interesting, it's kind of turned the traditional operating system teaching model around 180 degrees and so they're using DTrace to be able to explore the system and learn about a, uh, FreeBSD from a sort of very wide um, learn, and learn about kernel internals from a very wide perspective by using DTrace to find areas that are, are interesting to look, um, look at in, in greater depth, as opposed to the sort of more traditional uh, starting you know, with, with the operating system and stepping through and so I'll talk about this part and this part and this part. Um, and George is, is using that same sort of approach and material in producing a practitioner um, focused course. So um, sort of material that's more directly and immediately applicable to developers working um, on FreeBSD in, in, in their day-to-day -day work. Another uh, way the foundation supports uh, the FreeBSD project is by providing operational support. So there's a lot of um, tasks that need to happen just to keep FreeBSD.org running, whether that's um, maintain, maintaining the security of the systems, uh, system, system in work on upgrading and, and operating that, that infrastructure, and running releases. So um, the release engineering role is, is a, a great example of this. Um, leading up to um, uh, Glenn Barber's hiring as a foundation employee, um, he was doing an excellent job um, of running the FreeBSD release engineering process, um, but didn't necessarily have as much time um, available as, as, uh, as he would like. And it, it, came, it came up that he was available to, um, to join the foundation and work on that in a more permanent role. So um, when there was a gap in, in release engineering, the foundation stepped in and, and brought him on to, to keep that going. And I think, um, I would say our, our release engineering process now is running very, very smoothly and I'm very happy with the way that that's, um, that's working out. But the point, um, I guess an, a, a related point is that it's not the foundation's goal to take over the release engineering project uh, or aspects of the, the project. It is to support that and if, um, if Glenn moves on to working on other things and, a, a, and another capable release engineering lead comes uh, into that role, we're very happy to, uh, to have that happen and support them as necessary in, in uh, financially or, um, or through other, other means, equipment availability, et cetera. And then finally, one of the big uh, areas of focus for the foundation is direct project development. So this is working on um, features and improvements and enhancements to FreeBSD 
that perhaps aren't happening in the broader community uh, by themselves. And so my, my comment here is sub, uh, supplement, not supplant. The goal is not to try and take over FreeBSD development or do any work that's going to preclude someone else from working on something that they would like to work on or would otherwise work on uh, in any case. It really is to find those gaps in the development process and figure out how we can sort of fill in the pieces, the missing pieces um, of the, the overall development story. And so one example of that would be tool chain work that's coming up. There are a few people in the FreeBSD community that are doing excellent work on bringing new versions of Clang and, and other areas of, of tool chain work into FreeBSD. Um, but there's a few sort of missing pieces here and there in the overall tool chain story. Um, you know, it's either things that aren't particularly interesting or they're just um, sort of have fallen by the wayside. And so uh, I've stepped in in my, my role in, in the foundation to sort of try and pick up a few of those pieces and make sure that we have a complete and comprehensive tool chain story and let the people who are working on areas of interest to them to, to really focus on the parts that they, they want to work on. Um, and finally, the foundation also can provide a vehicle for bringing together multiple people who have similar er, er, interest in similar projects and coordinate working together on, on getting that done. So there are a lot of projects that are bigger than any one individual or any one company really wants to take on, but there may be two or three different companies that have an in, a similar interest and the foundation can facilitate getting that all, um, uh, getting them all to work together and, and build a, pr a feature that's, that's bigger. So the foundation provides individual project grants to developers, and this, is, this can either be a project that is proposed to the foundation, the developer says, I'd like to work on feature X, and it's going to deliver this, and it's going um, to cost this much, and the foundation will say, yeah, that's, that's a, a valuable thing that FreeBSD needs, and um, you know, we'd like to support you in that, and issue an individual, individual grant for that. Or the foundation may identify a, an area of, of a, a gap in FreeBSD and put out a call for proposals and say, we need someone to do this. And so Java might be an example of that. If we, if we identify that um, there's, there's a gap in the way Java uh, works on FreeBSD, we can, we can try and find someone to fill in that need. Um, and this doesn't have to be software development. It could be, say, a translation of um, some documentation. It could be improvements in the, um, the documentation infrastructure itself. That's, that's a project we funded in the past, was modernizing the, the tool chain that the documentation people um, uh, use to, to turn the FreeBSD source um, documentation into the, the final rendered, um, rendered version of the documents. And finally, uh, as part of the FreeBSD Foundation's mission, uh, supporting education is is part of that, uh, that stated mission. So funding university research, providing grants to, to universities for, say, a master's student is, is something else that we do. So AESNI is an example of an individual project grant. We had um, John Mark come to the foundation with a proposal to, do, to work on, uh, on an individual project and to update our, the open crypto implementation in FreeBSD. It hadn't been uh, been touched in a little while, and so John Mark said, you know, I, I want to bring in some improvements from OpenBSD and also add new crypto modes using the acceleration instructions in, in recent Intel processors, and you know, one of the goals is to, to improve IPsec performance, and here's, you know, here's the, the sort of broad overview of what this project will do, and here's what I expect it to deliver, and we said, yeah, that's actually something that, you know, it, it has been languishing a little bit. We need to, to support that, and so that's an example of an individual grant. The, f the current, uh, currently ongoing project to port FreeBSD to the ARM64 platform is an example of a consortium-style development. So this is a project that was originally started by Andy, Andrew Turner, a FreeBSD developer, uh, in his spare time two or three years ago. And he sort of was, was making pretty good progress, um, but had produced a, a workable proof of concept. He could get it to do some interesting things, but it wasn't at all a production uh, quality uh, port of, of FreeBSD. And so there was an interest from ARM themselves, from Cavium, who is a uh, semiconductor partner of ARM, who produces CPUs. Um, and, and we brought uh, Andy on, on a contract, and Semihap as well. Semihap's a consultancy that em employs a, a few FreeBSD developers. And so this project sort of became a much bigger focused effort to really make sure that FreeBSD um, ARM64 became a, or is, is on a path to becoming a tier one architecture within FreeBSD. And so now FreeBSD runs on, uh, Cavium has a, a dual socket 96 core ARM64 machine and, and we run on that. Um, there's still more work to be done to, to, be, um, to be a fully releasable tier one architecture, but 
uh, we've made some great progress and, and it really is a, um, a, a real platform. Multipath TCP is an example of a university um, university funded project. So this is a master's student at Swinburne um, in uh, Australia, in Melbourne or Melbourne as you, as you like. Uh, and one of the important things about university research is that it, we're not talking necessarily about producing a feature that will be deliverable into FreeBSD as is the project's done. It really is about the learning experience and the, and the, the research here. Um, we hope that we have a deliverable at the end that we can use as a, um, maybe the, a beginning point for additional engineering work and get it into FreeBSD in, in a usable form. But it isn't necessarily uh, a requirement for, of the project that, that that is the outcome. So more recently, um, two years ago or so, the foundation, uh, with, the, with the way that development has happened and with the foundation's budget, we've been able to bring on full-time permanent development staff. And so one of the key features of this is that it allows um, projects that are larger in scope or have, say, uh, a longer tail of support or improvements or bug fixes beyond what a, a single fixed, uh, fixed deliverable can accommodate. And so we have two full-time software developers working now and the sorts of things they work on. Well, it may still be individual projects that have a very fixed uh, fixed deliverable. And so this, this example here is the AutoFS ba uh, based auto mounter. This is something that Edward worked on. Um, Edward started out do doing a couple of individual project grants for the FreeBSD Foundation and then um, became available for, for longer term employment. So we said, you know, you've been doing excellent work and we'd like to be able to do, do more of this. Um, so the AutoFS uh, auto mounter came out of some discussion that the, that fa the foundation board had with various users of FreeBSD who said, you know, the, the AMD auto mounter that is in FreeBSD hasn't really been maintained particularly well and, and there's some, some issues with the way it works um, and it doesn't really integrate into our overall environment in the same way that um, Windows or, not sorry, Windows, uh, OS 10 or Linux um, or Solaris uh, do we, we know how to, to do those ones and AMD is sort of doing its own thing and so we said okay well uh, there's actually a lot of a, a pretty compelling argument to the way that auto, that auto FS based auto mounting is, is done so we'll sponsor uh, we'll have Edward work on this this project and and has delivered that um, so this is sort of usable for the traditional auto mount kinds of cases say NFS mounted home directories so the first time um, someone accesses their home directory, it automatically gets mounted for them, and then when, they're, when they log out, it, it can get unmounted. Um, but it's been extended as well to support removable media so that it can, you know, it, it can detect the file system on a USB stick that uh, is inserted and then automatically mounted. And, uh, and so it's, it's an example of, of the way that, you know, that, that wasn't really envisioned in the, the project when, when it was started, but it was a, a very simple extension. Um, and so having Edward just work on that was, uh, was excellent. Um, performance in work is another example of, of the sorts of thing that permanent staff, I think, is, it, it makes a very um, uh, compelling and uh, useful case for, um, for being able to, to take on additional capabilities here. So this is a, from about a year and a half or so ago. Um, there, was a report, there, were, there were reports in the FreeBSD community about performance issues with Postgres. Um, Postgres updated uh, a Postgres upgrade uh, from one, one version to another had a, a significant performance decrease and it turns out that they changed the way they did um, IPC from, from one version to the next and it basically triggered, triggered some pathological behavior on FreeBSD. And so uh, Constantine spent some time investigating the, um, investigating the, the reasons for this um, using the, the foundation provided uh, hardware that was at the Centex cluster. So there's a um, uh, four socket, 10 uh, CPU times two per, for hyper-threading. So 40 core, 80 thread machine um, with a terabyte of RAM at the Centex cluster. And so Caustic was able to use this to, to really profile the system and understand where the um, performance bottlenecks were coming from and then iterate through developing patches to fix these, um, these sorts of things. And that work has now delivered into FreeBSD head and, and um, into FreeBSD 10. And so this is a sort of, sort of area where we didn't really know what we were going to find or how much effort it was going to take to, to fix this. Um, it was just sort of, yeah, this is a uh, problem that the community has identified and let's have, have Caustic just go ahead and fix it. Um, 
UEF, our UEF, UEFI boot support is, is an example of a project that we originally started as a, um, as a, a small project to produce a, a proof of concept of UEFI booting. Um, a developer came to the, the FreeBSD Foundation and said, I have a couple of weeks available uh, and I'd like to, to try and get, uh, make some progress on UEFI booting. And so at the end of the two weeks, he had a proof of concept, but it wasn't something that could be delivered into the FreeBSD tree or um, wasn't sort of uh, fully complete. And as he, um, as he completed the, the, the scope of what was originally spec'd in that project, the work then transitioned uh, onto me to, to finish the integration and cleanup effort and get it into the tree. And so that work is now uh, in FreeBSD. Um, it was in FreeBSD head a while back, and um, the initial version shipped in FreeBSD 10.1, and 10.2 has some more, um, more enhancements. Um, the new, uh, new console driver in, in FreeBSD is also an, an example of, of a project like that, where there was a small uh, focused project originally funded by the foundation to implement this, this new console that integrates better with um, the uh, DRM KMS drivers, and so you can switch back and forth between um, X and the, and the console, and it introduced a few other, um, other features, uh, UTF-8 support and, um, uh, and sort of um, broader character set support. Uh, but there were a few other things that it, it didn't have um, at the time that the project wrapped up. And so one of the things I added, for, for example, after the fact, was support for double width characters for CJK fonts. So the FreeBSD console can actually display um, Japanese or, or Chinese characters um, on it. And there's still more work we'll do to, to continue that, that development. Um, but it's, it's an example of, of the way that uh, permanent staff can, can keep a project uh, moving ahead and, and keep enhancements going on. And so the foundation is 100% funded by donations. All of the money that's coming in is um, from organizations and individuals that use FreeBSD. Um, last year, we had a uh, sort of exceptional event. Jan Kuhn, um, the WhatsApp uh, founder, made a $1 million donation to the foundation, and so that was, that was excellent. Um, thank, thank you. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're very pleased with that, but we also realize that that is somewhat of an exceptional event, and so what we've decided to do with that money is take some of it to bump up the project development that we can do um, in the short term, but also keep a, uh, a sizable portion of it effectively as an endowment to support the foundation over the, the, the coming years. Um, we decided not to have a big party. Uh, <laughs> and so for 2015, our goal is to raise and spend about $1.25 million, and I'll show where that money will, will go in, in just a moment. Um, and right now, we're a little over uh, $400,000. And my final point here is one of, one of the, the goals that the foundation has is really trying to enable uh, individual developers who are working in companies that use FreeBSD, figuring out how to get the, uh, provide them useful material to go to their management and explain to them why FreeBSD is important, why the foundation is important, and why contributing um, to the overall community is important. So this, this is the, the fundraising that uh, the foundation has uh, and, and the uh, spending that the foundation has done since its inception. And so you can see the, the really large spike on the right um, with the $1 million donation. Um, and the, uh, you can see the, the, the spending that we've done trending up over time as well. Um, one of the, the, the sort of notable points is that our expenses, uh, our funding has always been, um, with a few exceptions, underneath the, the income that we've brought in. And I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I think we do want to spend our, uh, the money that, that individual donors and contributors have entrusted with us to make sure that we advance FreeBSD. On the other hand, we want to be conservative, and we don't want to spend the money just because we have it. It's very important to the board that we're spending the money on things that are providing the most value to FreeBSD. And so we're, we're working on um, spending more money on project development, spending more money on all the ways that we support FreeBSD, but we're still not willing to take on projects that, that don't have high value. And so here's where the, the money goes. Um, of the, uh, the 1.25 million for 2015, um, al almost exactly a million dollars of that is going to direct program support, um, and then some, some fundraising expense and administrative overhead uh, uses up the rest. 
And most of that program support is in direct project funding. So I think this is something that a lot of, um, a lot of people really, um, uh, really see as one of the foundation's primary benefits, and I think we agree. So um, between individual, pro pro uh, program, individual project grants, uh, university research, and our staff, um, our project development staff. So this, this uh, bar on the left is exclusively staff that are working on project development. And then the, the remaining um, uh, breakdown there. Hardware support obviously is, is very important uh, and conferences as well. And then the others um, uh, use up the rest of the money. And in other program expenses, uh, that includes things like legal expenses, um, going to the lawyer when the foundation's involved in, in um, legal issues or, uh, or that sort of thing. And with that, I will hand it over to George. Am I on? Is that okay? Good. <clears throat> so since I'm being filmed, I actually can't do what I would normally do, which is walk back and forth across the stage for the next 15 minutes, because I don't want to, yeah, see, he's got the, Things up there, so I'm I'm mostly going to do this, and I'll try to stop doing that. But I do I do kind of twitch. Um, so uh, Ed pointed out that I would talk uh, a little bit more in depth about the FreeBSD Journal. So a little bit of background on this. Uh, I don't just work on FreeBSD. It turns out I volunteer in several things because I'm an idiot. Um, and one of the things I've spent the last decade working on is a magazine for the Association for Com Computing Machinery called Q. And a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I was already on the board of directors for the foundation, and I was talking to our um, had the publisher of Q Magazine just before one of our editorial board meetings, and I said, so how expensive is it to make a magazine? He's like, oh, it's not that expensive. And I said, really? Well, how expensive? He's like, oh, not that much. And I thought, well, you know, what we really need, or one of the things that we really need in the FreeBSD community is another way to get, you know, information about FreeBSD out and to give people who want to use FreeBSD at work or you know, learn more about it, um, a way to do that. Right? There was a, a there, and there still is a, a, generic, a general BSD magazine. But you, know, you go into Barnes & Noble or whatever other remaining bookstores actually still exist on Earth, um, all three of them. And you know, there's a rack of Linux you know, magazines and now Raspberry Pi magazines. But there's no, you don't see a BSD magazine there. And of course, producing a paper magazine, as I've learned having done that before, is very expensive. Um, you know, you have to deal with things like subscriptions and mail, and it's you know, physical objects are expensive to move around the earth. Um, so a couple years ago, I you know, we sat down and I said, well, you know, it's it's kind of like that moment in the movie where you're like, hey kids, let's put on a show. Uh, so I went to the foundation board and I said, I want to spend a lot of money. And they said, how much do you want to spend? And I said, oh, probably about eighty thousand dollars. And they said, oh. Oh. Really? I said, no, it'll be great, really, trust me, it's gonna be awesome. Um, and so what we did with the journal is actually this follows the, the ACMQ model. We created an editorial board. Um, st some of the people on this list are here in the room, at least I know Drew is here, I'm here. Um, and for people in the FreeBSD project specifically, a lot of these names will be familiar. These are people who contribute. Uh, you know, so Kirk, Robert, and I wrote the most recent DNI book. Um, we then got together some columnists, uh, Glenn, Glenn Barber, who's here, and Drew's here, a columnist for us. We have a publisher, and the editor is Jim Morrow, who's basically published uh, Q for the last over a decade. And then we have a designer. And so the idea behind the journal was we were going to put together high quality content about FreeBSD, deliver it six times a year, um, charge for it, which people didn't seem to be very happy about, but that's how that works, um, and you know, see what we could do. See how, see how it was going to go. This is how it's gone. So uh, this is a screenshot I took from my uh, iPad uh, right after we published our most recent issue, the July-August issue. So you know, this is pretty impressive. If you look at uh, what's here, all of these articles. Like, so first of all, how many of our authors are in the audience? I know there's at least one, two. See, there's several people who've written for us in the audience. How many people get the journal in some form or another? Thank you very much. Um, because otherwise I would have been lynched for spending all that money. Um, thank you for not lynching me. So, you know, in the last couple of years, we've gotten 
we've delivered on time, sometimes at the very last moment, I will tell you, um, you know, 10 issues of this magazine, and it's going extremely well. Um, and it's a really amazing thing for advocacy. So one of the things that Ed talked about in the earlier slides is the foundation's, one of the foundation's roles is advocacy. So what, what am I, what is your next trick? Watch me pull this rabbit from my hat. Um, so upcoming work, well we've always got more work to do. So more great content. If people in the audience are interested in writing, and actually by the way, there's a lot of people in, in the community who are, you ask them, they've done some really great piece of technical work and you're like, you should really write an article about that. They're like, oh, I can't write. And I'm like, okay, here, let me show you a raw thing that I wrote and show you what an edited version looks like. Right? Because the, we actually pay editors to do a good job to make us not sound like idiots. So if you can string sentences together, you can probably write for us. Um, so we're always looking for new content, always looking for new authors. Uh, we're gonna do a modernization sweep across the platform. Uh, some of the way in which the content is delivered and how it looks. Uh, we're gonna move to a, a more, an even more mobile friendly model. So for any of you who actually read other magazines on digital media, uh, if you look at Vice, I like to read Vice, um, there I've recorded that, or uh, The New Yorker, which I guess is a higher brow version of saying I read Vice. Um, those, the models of the way that's delivered, uh, that's what that's gonna look like probably in about a year. And so for my next trick, I've put up 20,000 subscribers because in computer science, we just double things, right? Like one, two, four, eight, 16. We got to 10,000, so clearly there must be 10,000 more people who wanna read the FreeBSD journal. Uh, note, I only put a number there, I didn't put a date, because I am a software person. So I'm gonna deliver something awesome at some point in the future. Um, all right, so Ed talked a lot about what we've done. See, I told you I'm gonna keep pacing. Um, Ed talked a lot about what the foundation does now, what we've done in the past, a bit of what we're doing in the future. But one of the things when um, we were sitting down to do the presentation that I realized that we never really talk about when we talk about the foundation is, well, what could we do, right? And um, I, I went back and forth between a million, a billion, and a trillion. And a trillion really is infinite money, and billion to me would certainly be infinite money, although it does remind me of a, a story. Um, when I was in eighth grade, we, we did you know, the American history thing, and uh, we were talking about the robber barons and how much, I think, Carnegie made from selling his company, which was a billion dollars in like 1905. And my uh, social studies teacher said, well, and you, know, you could never spend that money. I could spend that money. <laughs> No, you couldn't. Yes, I could. I'd buy an island and an aircraft carrier and a whole bunch of F-14s. And you know, was, he's like, oh, I guess you could spend that money. I'm like, totally could spend that money. Um, so when I was thinking about you know, what would the foundation do if we had you know, more than 1.25 million? What if we had a billion dollars? Let's imagine we had a lot of money. Uh, what are some of the things we could do? And some of this list will be incremental, right? We would do more of the same things we do today. We'd hire staff to help us doing things that you know, we have to depend on volunteers to do. And volunteers are great. But volunteers have day jobs and children and you know, they have other things to do, it turns out. Some of us, I clearly don't, but there are people who do. Um, so what we do, so this is sort of a laundry list of things that I think are interesting to think about and things that I think people in the community should think about when they think about other things we can do. Um, so one of the things, sponsored hardware. So I'm mostly responsible for the hardware budget from the foundation because I was the person foolish enough to say I'd like to build a test lab and they said how much and I said I don't know uh, I do that a lot Deb, Deb doesn't like that how much is that gonna cost mm -hmm. that much um, so sponsored hardware so uh, Ed talked about uh, arm 64 arm v8 is a great example of trying to get now we weren't first to market with this um, you know NetBSD had some stuff Linux obviously you know they were well supported but you know the Linux model is a uh, shouldn't call it a mafia model because I'm being recorded, but it is kind of a mafia model. It's, it's a nice processor you got there, you should probably give us some money for it. Um, but the goal for the BSD, for VBSD in particular, should be to be coming out on new hardware at the same time as the other open source operating system, right? And you know, the ARMv8 work combined cost, you know, that was a quarter million dollars, right? Which is not a billion but to pretty much most people in this room, I suspect, is real money. Uh, so one of the things, we had infinite money again, 
we would be able to do that. So you look at new processor architectures, and there are a couple coming out. Uh, you look at the Power 8 stuff, which seems to now be relevant, or RISC-V, which is probably going to be one of the big hardware research platforms over the next decade. Um, getting FreeBSD up and running on that, we can do it with volunteers, but if we had a lot of money, we could be like, okay, look, we want to get this work done. Get it done. Um, so everyone who's only using a Mac, raise your hand. Come on. I'm, I'm looking. I see a whole bunch of Macs out there. Right? Why is that? Well, it's in part because suspend resume works on your Mac. Right? <laughs> um, now, back there, you'll see an X230, which is my X230 next to my Mac. And suspend resume now works on both of those machines. But you know, one of the things is that getting machines into the hands of developers that they can really use every day is a good way to get people to keep using the system. And one of the problems that all of the open source operating systems have had for a long time um, is good laptop support. You know, IX at one point tried to produce a laptop. Dell currently ships an XPS 13 with Linux, with an Ubuntu Linux. And the problem of laptop support is there's you know, a bunch of different models and you can't for love, but you could for money, get the documentation on how to fix the damn thing, right? So it was like, hey, we're from the FreeBSD Foundation. We'd like to sign an NDA with Broadcom to get a blah, blah, blah. Who are you? Like, oh, hey, we've got $50,000, and we'd like to buy the documentation for that. Oh, well, we'll sell it to you, right? So that's one way in which money could actually be useful here, because we've got plenty of people who'd hack on it and who always are like, oh, I'd love to fix that widget, whatever the widget is. Um, but we don't, we, you know, we need to buy documentation. And then we get to more esoteric devices. So like, you know, when all the PCI flash stuff came out, um, I talked about, and, and Ed has mentioned, the Centex lab. So the Centex lab has a pre-release beta version of an Arista 10 gig switch that's so old it's labeled a Rastra. How did we get that? Well, I used to work for a high frequency trading company, and they had one laying around. And I said, hey, can I have that? And that is the model of how we've acquired most of the hardware on the project, right? I mean, some of the hardware, like these big machines we bought, usually from IX, actually. They've, they've been very good about selling us at a low cost. You know, these 80-core machines we've bought. But a lot of it's kind of like, hey, you're, you're not using that, are you? Because we could use that. Um, if we had, you know, if we think big, then we could actually get out ahead of these things, right? We could be like, oh, you know, 100 gig is the next thing, and I can tell you 100 gig is the next thing in networking. By the way, networking person. I'm sure there's a list of storage stuff that could go here, but I don't know where bits are stored. I just know how they're transmitted. Um, you know, we could be like, hey, we'd like to buy one of those and give access to our developers, you know, give our developers access to that. Um, you know, getting people next. And then, of course, I, I do like this, uh, BeagleBone in every pot. Right? Now, BeagleBones are cheap, but if we buy one for everyone on the project, just like, hey, you've got a commit bit. We just sent you an ARM board. Right? That would be totally cool if like, you didn't just get responsibility for destroying the tree, but you got a new toy. Because um, it turns out new toys work for developers. Um, and I discovered this, uh, I talked, and I'm going to talk a bit about, I'll talk about that in a second, um, talk a bit about training. One of the things that Robert and I are doing in the, in the master's course is we teach it on a BeagleBone Black. And I have this very amusing experience often where I'll be talking about the class. We're like, well, we're teaching, we do D-Trace, we're doing this stuff. And I gave this talk at um, Microsoft Research in Cambridge a couple, let's see, it was before we did the class, so it was last summer. And, you know, it's a room full of people who work for Microsoft and they do research and, you know, these people have, like, advanced degrees and access to millions of dollars of computing power. And I take a BeagleBone blackout and I put it on the podium. I'm like, oh, we're teaching on this. And they're all like, ooh, can I, can I touch that? I'm like, that's a $50 box. You could buy it, which I didn't say because I was being polite. Um, but, you know, it turns out we can give everyone a beagle bone or whatever the latest toy was. That'd be cool, right? Here's your new toy. I like toys. Um, other things we could do. So this is another sort of incremental thing that we would do. We already sponsor conferences, summits, and hackathons. Um, but what you see in, you know, again, if you look at the other big open source community, is that because they have a huge amount of funding, and they do, um, they can get their developers together a lot more often. Um, and they can do much more focused events. So think about things like, you know, there's a portathon. We get we take all the ports developers who've got a week and we put them all in a room and magic generally happens. Um, probably drinking too, but I suspect some magic. Um, you know, a dot con, uh, like a, a storage thing, we'd call it free fast just to piss off Usenix. 
Um, Connect BSD would be the networking one. And you know, you can talk about setting these up, and certainly, you know, people do. You know, Verisign has made this really great conference. There's BSD CAN, there's Asia BSD. That takes a lot of work. And then getting people there, and you know, hotels are not cheap. Um, you know, making it so that people are fed, all of that stuff, that's where you know, an incremental, a large increment of money would go for the foundation. If we could do more, what would we do? Uh, as we talked about, about training, um, so you know, most of the people who use FreeBSD either are self-taught or you know, edu you know, college educated computer people. Um, but to get FreeBSD to be used in more environments, you actually have to create content that can be given to people who are not people with a CS degree or an interest in CS or an interest in computers. Um, I mean, DevOps, they should be interested in computers, I hope, and developers. But you know, think about developing training for people using it in banks, right? So there is still a company, like almost all of the, the uh, large financial transactions processed in the US go through a company that uses FreeBSD. Um, but they have a problem, which is they need to convince banks to host their stuff because banks have lists. And the list says Windows, Linux, and whatever Oracle tells us to buy, right? But it doesn't include BSD, right? So you need to create material for other markets, um, banks, medical, science. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about science at the end. And the other thing is getting more people to do this, right? So one of the reasons that the foundation is able to do as much as it does is that a lot of the companies that fund the foundation built their businesses with FreeBSD and understand the value of that. But we need to keep enabling that, right? We need to keep making it so that there are new VeriSigns, NetApps, uh, Icelons, Junipers, all of those companies, there need to be more of those. Now the people here from those companies are like, no, there don't. No, it's just, just us. Um, I understand that. It's a, don't tell your legal people I said this. But, um, you know, this is, this is another thing that we need to get out there. And if we, you know, this is something you need people to do to create this stuff. Um, more traditional education. So we could do a full spectrum of materials for, for teaching, right? So a year ago, Robert Watson and I sat down and we're like, hey, we could do this course thing. And Robert's like, oh, I could teach at Cambridge. I'm like, well, that'd be awesome. Um, you know, how do we expand that, right? So right now it's a graduate course, which means it's much more narrowly focused. I've got a couple of universities in the US looking at it. Uh, UC Santa Cruz is going to teach with FreeBSD this fall, now that I fixed their virtual machine problem. And um, it's like, use this version. And uh, some of the folks on the East, a couple of universities on the East Coast are looking at it, but that's a small group. And one of the reasons to really push education, as the Jesuits will tell you, is if you get them young, then they will continue using it. So how many people here in this room started out using Linux? Right? And we can see an age demographic there. Now, how many people started out using BSD? Right? And so you're the only young person who raised their hand. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> right? And so one of the things we've got to do is we've got to get you know, BSD into education so that people are exposed to it as something they just used at college or you know, in junior high school or high school. Or I put up elementary free BSD. Um, it'd be interesting to teach an elementary course in free BSD. I don't know how that would work. Um, and definitely getting into under, undergraduate um, computer science is, is the, the big place to get into. Uh, we're already actually doing pretty well in graduate research. One of the things I've been putting together is a, a reference bibliography of all the places that FreeBSD is used in research papers. And it's being used more often, in particular because of things like LLVM. Uh, LLVM and FreeBSD have been used in a bunch of uh, computer science research at Urbana-Champaign um, in Illinois. And then the you know stuff that's done in Cambridge and a bunch at Harvard, a bunch of places have been doing that. And you know, we if we had a billion dollars, we could fund a research chair. They could be the free BSD chair of some university. Um, probably we should do it at Berkeley. Just saying. Um, make McCusick go back to school. Documentation. How could we better support you know the documentation? I mentioned the idea of uh, just a pure doc con. Right? You know, the doc folks always do these doc sprints which are associated with other events and that's great. But what if they could have their own you know, three day conference somewhere where they just get together and you know, hammer out all the translations. And one of the things, it's interesting when I talk to other people about FreeBSD and people come up to me at conferences and they're like, oh, you work on FreeBSD? And I'm like, yes, you've heard of it? I don't actually say that. 
But uh, one of the things they always compliment us on is the documentation, right? And it's interesting because I've spent so long in the BSD world that I don't, if I can help it, make forays into other worlds. And then I'm like, how do you people do anything? Like Stack Exchange is not a documentation system, right? It's an upvoting for bad comments. Um, so, you know, given the docs folks, uh, you know, DocCon would be great. And then having people to write the stuff that developers don't write and documentation people don't write offhand, right? White papers. So we've actually had um, just Kong doing a couple of these for us uh, under contract, and we would like to fund more of that, right? You know, there's got to be the thing of like, you know, giving stuff to C level executives to explain what FreeBSD is so that when one of us geeks shows up and is like, hey, I use FreeBSD, they're like, is there a use case for that? You give them the white paper because you don't want to be making the presentation to the C-level person, at least I try not to. Um, and you know, getting us into places where we don't normally show up, like not just purely in, in tech news. So things we could do beyond the operating system, Java, right? I don't program in Java. I am not now, nor have I ever been a Java programmer. But it turns out that it's very important to a large segment of people who use computers, and it's a significant impediment to the uptake of FreeBSD, and just generally. Um, so, you know, we've got, so Greg Lewis has been doing a great job working on the Java stuff. He's very passionate about it. He's one person. Java turns out to be something that requires maybe more than one person. Um, you know, being able to fund Java development and get a, you know, an actual Oracle certified, uh, it makes me creepy to say that, um, version of Java out is something that we'd really love to be able to do. Um, huge amounts of, you know, ports and package testing and validation, all the things that people consider middleware, the new orchestration systems, and, and someday there'll be a web 4.0, and whatever that is, we should probably get ahead of it instead of being like, oh yeah, we, can, we think we can do that. QA. Um, we've got people who've been setting up uh, Jenkins, continuous integration stuff, uh, that's great. I myself have worked on some of the test automation for networking, which is something in my uh, talk on Sunday. Um, but this is an area where any open source project could use a lot of help. Um, so think about full test automation of unit tests, systems tests, performance work, code coverage, a staff test lab. And this is a place where actually bringing new people into the project would be interesting because we could have an internship program. right? One of the things that companies do when they bring on co-op students or interns, I was a co-op student when I was at university, is they wind up working in this area, right? It's sort of their first taste of how big systems are built. Um, so, you know, at the moment, we are very lucky to have a company that's quite interested in hosting a lab for us, and they are awesome remote hands. And I can tell you, having worked with awesome and not so awesome remote hands, you really want the awesome ones. Um, but, you know, th this isn't their day job. They happen to like working on our stuff, and it's great. It'd be good if we could have you know, the FreeBSD test lab with the person who runs it and is working on the automation all the time. And, you know, developers can be like, oh, I just added, you know, this thing to TCP. I wonder what happens. Click, right? As opposed to, well, let's just get VeriSign to run it and see what happens. I'm sure they love that part. This is my, uh, this is if I really did have a billion dollars. <clears throat> so the HPC market is narrow but interesting. Why is it interesting? It's interesting because it's, um, how do I say this nicely? There's a Freudian way to explain this, but basically computer people really like big computers, and the bigger the computer and the faster it is, the cooler you are. I mean, Protein folding is useful. Um, anyway, so, you know, if we had a billion dollars, we could build an HPC cluster, and we could have it as a demo cluster to show the things you could do with FreeBSD. So get 2,000 hosts together, petabytes of storage, teraflops of compute, terabits of network, and we would always be in the top 500 list. So if you look up top 500 supercomputers on your web browsers, you'll see those, and you'll see how much they cost, <clears throat> and how much they cost, to, I mean, the power alone would cost that. Uh, we'd need a couple of things. Uh, there's this thing called Fortran. Anybody else ever, I taught Fortran. There you go, two of us. Uh, it turns out people still use this, it's really weird. Um, and then MPI, so we'd need some software for this. But this is, this would be an amazing project to fund, right? All right, so now I've given you my laundry list of why I want a billion dollars. Um, but mostly what I've tried to do is get people to 
I, I'm hoping that you come away from this thinking about what a really well-funded foundation can do for a project. And I hate to always refer to Linux, but I get all the Linux Foundation materials because I want to see what the enemy is doing. Um, I mean, they're not really my enemy. No, no, they are actually. Um, it's competition. And, you know, they don't do all of this, but they do a lot of this. And they do a lot of it because they have the money to do it, right? And so if you think about what you do with an open source funding foundation, these are the kind of goals you really have to have, right? So the things we're do we've done to date, they're great. Um, I'm really proud of the work the foundation has done, and I'm really proud of the growth that we've had over the last 15 years. And I've you know, only been on the board for a few years, but I'm proud of the work we've done there. Um, but we really need to set our sights higher, and that's what that list is about. So, this is the last slide, right? Okay, so Ed's gonna come join me on the podium, I guess. Um, we'd like to hear feedback. We'd like to, we'd like to take your money. Um, and I think I have two minutes for questions. I will be at the table. If you want to come yell at us, please do. So any quick questions? There's a microphone up here, which I think they probably want you to use. Excellent. I put you all to sleep, and now Michael will try to wake you up. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.